You know, just to give a little background on myself, uh, my, if you go to the 1850 Upper Canada Census, okay, I grew up in a part of Ontario, the, one of the oldest parts of Canada, and uh, in the 1850 census, my great-grandmother wrote in for her religion, Disciple of Christ. That's because my family goes back probably into the 1830s. So uh, it's, there's a long history. Uh, the person that my great-great-grandfather bought our farm from, uh, I recognized his name in a document about the restoration movement in Canada. He was the first treasurer of the Beamsville Church, and he's the guy that actually sold uh, that farm to my great-great-grandfather that then became uh, Fleming Farms and... Uh, uh, you know, produced a lot of chickens, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> okay, so uh, understanding our, his, our history, um, you know, again, I just have to begin to say thank you to the Tallinn Church for just doing an amazing job. It's so great to be here. Uh, there, there, there was a shout out to Valdor and Malcolm already, but I just wanted to shout out again. Thank you, Valder and uh, Malcolm, wherever you are, uh, just thank you for what you've done to help make this conference a success. Uh, I want to talk about understanding our place in history, not just understanding our history. Um, you know, it's interesting to look at the early church. Uh, the, there was like, I, I'm going to divide this up into a number of uh, sections. So, you know, the early church was initiated within the context of Judaism and was very Jewish from the onset. Absolutely. Uh, in fact, it was considered a Jewish sect in the, in the very beginning. Uh, and then, of course, you have this Constantinian shift we're going to talk about, where uh, the first ecclesiastical, ecclesial council for the whole world was actually put on by the Emperor Constantine. It's a, it's a, it's a shady deal, let me tell you. An, a, an emperor paid to get all the church leaders around together. And uh, he himself, I don't, at that time, wasn't even a baptized Christian. But you know, he was at the meetings, and you know he had an agenda. And uh, eventually, uh, not too long in the, in the future, we'll talk a little bit about this, uh, Christianity became the religion of Rome. Uh, then you have the Reformation, and this is a pretty significant moment uh, in church history. Uh, we have the Restoration Movement. And as we go through these things, every one of these phases are... Their context is the phase before. They're coming out of something. They're in response to something. They're not isolated. Uh, it's a myth to think you can create a church in isolation. Even if there was no Christians here and I just brought a Bible, I have a context, you have a context. There'd still be something that gets built into what we're doing based on the context itself. Uh, and then I want to talk about the International Churches of Christ which came out of the Restoration Movement. And, and to be honest, if I was going to be more exact, the Restoration Movement split into three major divisions. It split once, and then the other division, not the part I was in, the uh, a cappella part, it split another time uh, in the uh, early 1900s. And so we, we just had this ongoing uh, division. So from a Church of Christ point of view, the uh, International Churches of Christ spinning off was not the biggest deal. It was sad. But it's kind of built into the history already of the Restoration Movement, and we're, we're going to talk about that a little bit. So what do we have? Uh, you know, be, before we get too deep into there, I just want to share uh, something that's been going on in my life. And, you know, Patrick Genova is here, and I'm really, really thankful for him. Um, I'm going to be uh, pointing you towards my website a bit tonight, okay? Uh, that's what websites are for. Um, I'm very excited uh, to just to have this resource up and running. Uh, it it's a little bit of a le legacy project for myself. I wrote my first, I would say, serious publishable ar article about the ICOC. It was actually a rebuttal to Flavel Yakely's book in 1988. And I, st I spent the time to actually read his book a couple of times and then answer a number of the accusations that were in there and present some other points of view. Why? Because I desperately wanted unity between the church that I had grown up with and the Boston movement. Uh, I can say that I failed miserably in that, but uh, you know, while we're here on, the, uh, on just the, the website, let me just share one thing with you. Uh, my website's free, by the way. 
just in case you're wondering. Uh, and it's a project of love. Uh, this is the first principles that, that we uh, used in the church in Birmingham, England. And so you can just choose any, any of these studies. Uh, say, God's Spirit lives in us. And then you can you know, click on the scripture reference. I've got that little window come up. I'm so proud of my technology. <laughs> then if you want to see the scripture, you just push on the scripture verse and, the, and it opens up and there you have the scriptures quoted right there. So you can go through the study very conveniently. And uh, again, did I... Oh, yes. Did, did I say it's free? Okay, good. good, good. You know, I like to emphasize things are free because you really can't complain if it's free, right? Anyway, um, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the early centuries. Uh, the church spread out from Jerusalem in the lifetime of the apostles. And the New Testament speaks specifically of Peter, John, and Paul when it comes to ministry beyond Jerusalem. Uh, we really don't know anything else about anybody else. Uh, but we do have early church traditions. Philip went to Phrygia, Asia Minor, martyred in Hierapolis. Andrew, Asia Minor, Scythia, Greece, martyred in Achaia. Bartholomew, uh, Elam, Media, Mesopotamia, Arabia, India, martyred in Armenia. A lot of these guys ended in martyrdom, right? Um, uh, Thomas went to Parthia, Matthew to Ethiopia. Then, of course, much tradition puts Matthew in India. Uh, then Matthias stayed in Judea. These are all very early, early traditions. Uh, what's interesting is uh, how much communication did they have back with where they came from? You know, when these guys went out, they went out. You know, it was pretty tough when I was growing up in the Churches of Christ, most missionaries would go out for, like, they measured their time in two years, and they'd go serve for a year and a half and then come back for six months to raise funds to go for another two years. And that was a very typical pattern that they did. But, you know, there's, there was letters. Uh, I was a missionary in the jungle of Papua New Guinea and still got mail in the village. Sometimes it took three weeks to get there. It was usually pretty smudged and a little grimy by the time I got my letter, but this, the mail did come through eventually. Uh, sometimes it got past village to village just to catch up to me if I was, was traveling. But uh, the early centuries are, are interesting because they are based, we, we know a lot, if you just look at the New Testament record, we have this little window of time where we know quite a bit. I mean, comparatively. Uh, really, for the first couple of hundred years after the New Testament is done, we don't know very much at all. Uh, we're piecing together things. I mean, Eusebius wrote a history of the church in the early 4th century, and he was guessing a fair bit, if you can kind of read between the lines on stuff that he was saying. Uh, he wasn't sure of every tradition that he had been given. Um, something I want to share with you is uh, on my website, you'll find this article. It's a shifting paradigm. It's over 70 pages long altogether. I wrote this as a conversation starter, not starter, that's not the right word. Uh, it was a discussion document for the uh, 2002 Long Beach meeting. This is before the Henry Crete letter, but it was at the same time that Kip resigned. And it was basically to let's talk about the New Testament church. Uh, I sent this actually hard copy to everyone that was coming to the meeting, over 170 copies, and I gave them about a month to read it. Uh, when we got to this meeting, I found out that five people had read it and they were all teachers. Uh, you know, very, very sad, right? Because I wanted to come to this meeting to really talk about our future, but the only way to talk about our future was to go back and talk about the Bible. And, you know, you can see it's a, you know, it's, I actually still to this day will say it was a, it was a good right. It's a, it's a good biblical study. I make no personal recommendations in this study. It was meant simply to be a biblical foundation for a conversation about what the church should look like. But as you can see, the very thing begins a church in transition. And see, my thesis was that as we are going through transitions, we need to understand that the church of the New Testament was also going through transitions. And they're pretty significant. Uh, here's the first one. The transition of the church's membership from being completely Jewish to being significantly Gentile. 
And the transition of public worship within the framework of established Jewish forms and customs, both temple and synagogue, to the church's own norms and practices, that's gigantic. You know, as the Jews lost their connection to what they'd grown up with, that was, that was drastic. There's a lot of loss there. And uh, the, the Gentiles are coming in. They're bringing also their own ideas about worshiping God. Uh, they're bringing in their own ideas of what salvation is, etc. And of course, they're surrendering in broad themes those to the Christian message. But no matter how much you kind of talk with someone, there's still going to be things coming out over time, right? Uh, the second big transition was how leaders were appointed and trained. Uh, the original crew was, were trained by Jesus. That's going to be a hard act to follow, right? Um, what happens then? Uh, well, Jesus even gave uh, them miraculous gifts so that they could confirm their message. That was convenient. Uh, I, that, I you know, I've sometimes wish that that was still going today. Um, but to the second generation leaders, they were being trained and appointed by the previous generation. And the accreditation of leadership was a matter of personal faith and the outcome of a minister's way of life. In other words, you had your ministry, but you also had the moral authority of who you were just as a disciple of Jesus. That's a pretty big change between just, you know, doing a miracle. Jesus sent me, watch this. And I don't think they quite demonstrated it that way, but that was sort of the net result in a number of circumstances. But then also this one, the transition of new prophecy and revelation being received by select individuals spread by word of mouth and of limited accessibility to prophecy and revelation being recorded, written down, collected, copied, and circulated among the churches. Man, think about these transitions. This is just in one generation. The church went through all of this. And that second generation had to carry it further. Uh, it's, it's a pretty amazing story. You know, one of the reasons we have so many denominations there's been so many people in good faith saying, I just want to go back to the scripture. But they choose the wrong snapshot or they choose a static picture, a collage that they've made rather than ask a question, what was this like? So we have a whole Pentecostal movement based on recapturing the day of Pentecost. Now, you know, if God wanted to give us a second day of Pentecost, he'd do that without asking us. You know, instead, these, these people, I mean, honestly, worked themselves into a state until they had this experience of glossolalia, and that began the charismatic movement in its modern form today. And the whole idea is we're going back to the Bible. This is, now, it's the fastest growing single Christian movement in the world is uh, the Pentecostal church. So don't, don't just think, well, how did people do it? Believe me. They've, they've had a very effective run as missionaries around the world. Um, so this depends, where, like when it comes to church polity, what kind of church government are we going to have? It sort of depends where you're reading at the time in the church. And so people have their sort of favorite models. I think what we need to understand is that uh, there was a lot of diversity. I love it as you read through Acts. The church in Antioch was led by prophets and teachers. No mention of any apostle, no mention of any evangelist, uh, no mention of any elders at that point. And then it says that they sent out two of them that the Holy Spirit set aside, and those two are then later called in their journey apostles. So they actually produced two more apostles. One of them happened to be Paul. Now we know his story, he was chosen before, but he wasn't going by the title apostle until he actually got sent out by the church. And then he became a missionary. And in the beginning of his journey, Barnabas is mentioned first, and then it switches. So the first half on the way out, it's Barnabas and Paul, and it doesn't take too long till it's Paul and Barnabas. And I got a feeling uh, that has a little bit to do with just who Paul was as a person too. What's interesting, people have been trying to come back to the Bible for centuries. In fact, I think it's probably true to think that in the second, second generation, they were already trying to recapture the first generation. They were already trying to go back. And of course, they had eyewitnesses. They had people who had heard the apostles. Pretty amazing. But look at these warnings uh, from the New Testament 
Because we look at church history and it is a mess. It's sloppy. Uh, something inside of us thinks it shouldn't be this way. But you know, just I'm going to be blunt, Satan doesn't care what's going on in Islam. He couldn't care less. He's got nothing. To, he's, he doesn't worry about Islam. It's not going to save anybody. It's not going to give, bring them into a saved relationship covenantally with Jesus Christ and God the Father. It's not going to do that. So he doesn't care. Why is Christianity the most divided religion the world has ever seen and still continuing to divide? Because we are facing, we are in a true spiritual battle like no other religion. We are the one that Satan wants to destroy. And so these are warnings written in scripture for us. False leaders will distort the truth to draw away disciples from themselves. Surely not, we say. False teachers will introduce destructive teachings contrary to scriptures and make up stories for personal financial gain. <coughs> Book of Mormon, you know, whatever, okay? Um, you know, what's going on? It, 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 this was predicted in the first century. It was predicted by the first generation. False followers will compromise sound doctrine and encourage others to lead them that will teach the message they want to hear. Hmm. Uh, traditions taking precedent over clear biblical teaching. And we have that in Matthew 15, Mark 7. Mandatory celibacy in the Roman Catholic Church contradicts clear biblical teaching. Not that you have to get married, but in 1 Timothy 4, 1 to 5, which actually predicts it, uh, just in the chapter before it, it says the overseas or bishops must be married and successful leaders of their families. I mean, so the New Testament says a bishop must be married. The Catholic Church says a bishop can't be married. Well, you go to 1 Timothy 4, 1, and where does it say this kind of teaching comes from? He says it's a, these people have abandoned the faith and following deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Now, I know that we have used Galatians 5, divisions and factions, just to look at denominations in general. I think we need to back up a little bit, because that's the action of dividing and causing factions. That's not being a member of one because you don't know any better. Oh, you're a Catholic? You're divisive. Huh? What are you talking about? You're the Protestant. You, you divide it for me. You know what I'm saying? Like, like there's, there are people that are responsible for changing the course of a group of people in the name of God. Each one will give account. Uh, you know, uh, it was referenced by Steve this morning. Scariest verse in the Bible to me is, let not many of you be teachers. You'll be judged with a stricter judgment. Like that rings in my mind all the time. And if I'm going to speak publicly, I'm going to do my homework. I'm going to know what I said. You know, it's funny. I can go back now and publish uh, like do things I wrote 35 years ago without any shame. Uh, you can't find Andy Fleming saying the ICOC is the only church. I never said that. Now, did I fight the battle hard enough to try to get others not to say that? Yes and no. You know, I know that guilt by association is a very real thing. And it's very easy for people to look and say, but you should have, you should have, you should have. Uh, you know, that's a, the, you, you're in a pickle of a position. Uh, do, what do I risk and what do I break? What do I accept? And we're going to talk a little bit about that because the very ethos of the original restoration movement was about unity. You don't get unity by being dogmatic. That doesn't produce Unity. So, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So, you know, as the church developed, we had the apologists, and I won't uh, mention much about them, simply that they were helping the church interface with Greek culture around them. We have the early church fathers, and they were more trying to wrestle with the theological questions. And of course, probably the relationship between the father and son was one of the, one of the biggest ones. Uh, you know, the word Trinity was n not even coined until about the the beginning of the third century, and it wasn't even coined in its current form in its current understanding. It took a few centuries more. It was kind of like cleanup after they finished father and son discussions. Oh yeah, what do we do with the Holy Spirit? I'll just throw this out. I think about the persons of the Holy Spirit, not the person of the Holy Spirit. And you can think about that later. That's just something to put in your hat. Okay. Okay. 
The Holy Spirit is a person. In fact, he's two persons, but uh, we'll get into that. Okay, so the early centuries. Uh, you know, it's interesting to see already what started to happen because the call to discipleship is challenging. And if you want to build a socially acceptable church uh, or have a group that's going to be loved by everybody, churches might go through a love phase with the society they're in, but it will end. Uh, when the message is finally understood that there is a clear understanding. You know what I find so funny? People that say, how can the God of the Old Testament be the same as the God of the New Testament? Look at all the destruction. Look at the killing of, of nations, etc. Have you not read the New Testament? How's all this going to end? You know, according to the New Testament, God said a day when it's going to end for everybody. I got news from you. There's going to be millions of children in that moment. There's going to be millions of people. That, you know, in other words, what happened on a limited scale to a group of people is now going to happen to everybody living on earth. You think the Old Testament was tough? You know, it's just ridiculous. But see, people are like, well, that's far away. I don't really think about it. That's history. No, the, all of these instances of judgment in the Old Testament, were there for, they're there for us to teach us and to give us a conviction. Believe me, one day... It's over. Little freebie about eternal life. It's not going to be some random judgment. God's simply going to look into your heart and the question is going to be asked. Did you want to be with me or not? And did you show that by how you lived? It's going to be a faith question. Will baptism matter then? That's not, it's not going to be about baptism or not on judgment day. It's going to be about your attitude towards God. Baptism was given for our own security and assurance, but God can save whoever he wants to. It isn't baptism that saves by itself. It's God who saves through baptism. Do you understand? So there's a problem in the first century. They, they, they coined these words rigor and laxity. And so there were those that wanted to be fired up disciples of Jesus. And there are those that wanted a church that was nice, good singing, good fellowship, but, uh, you know, I still want to make a lot of money. I still want to live the good life in the world. So um, in the, the Tertullian and, and Cyprian, they were both guys that were really trying to push the church for rigor. This is, this is just direct quotes from the writings of Cyprian. Uh, he would have written this. Oh, he wrote this in 249. The church before the persecution was blemished with greed, worldliness, marriage to unbelievers, and bishops who were busy with business and neglecting the flock. Okay, this is, you know, it's written right here. He had lived through a persecution without denying Christ. Since the essence of being a disciple was to give up everything, every Christian should be ready to confess and be martyred. Okay. Then he went on. The lapse needed to truly, the lapse, those who denied Christ under pressure needed to truly lament and mourn for their sin and make right confession, those that continue to live in a worldly manner disregarding the poor should not be accepted. Okay. There's some good teaching in there, right? But do you see what the church was already facing? There was a battle going on in the third century between should the church hold on to its convictions, live different than the world, or conform? Well, guess who won? Conformity won. And the rigor was lost. And the Catholic Church and, and Orthodox churches through the years have tried many ways to revitalize rigor, mostly focused on their clergy, not so often focused on their laity. So that's the early centuries. I want to talk about the Constantinian shift. Um, the beginning of the fourth century contained some serious milestones. In 3001, Armenia became the first country to officially recognize as their national religion uh, Christianity. And then they were followed by Georgia. In 311, the last great persecution of the Roman Empire ended with the Edict of Toleration. In 313, the emperors Constantine and Licinius declared Christianity legal and affirmed religious freedom. In 325, the emperor Constantine called the First Council of Nicaea as an effort to attain consensus in the church formulation of the Nicene Creed, which was the most specific statement of faith to date. Then in 391, so 80 years after the Edict of Toleration, the Emperor Theodosius ordered the cessation of sacrifices and the clothing, closing of the pagan temples. 
The Roman Empire was now officially Christian and religious freedom greatly d diminished, if not even extinguished. So, you know, Christianity came into existence in the Roman world and eventually got its freedom. And after it got its freedom in 80 years, all the other religions, their freedom was taken away. The whole thing got, got changed. And so, you know, we have a history of just very sad moments of uh, uh, we have crusades fought in the name of Christ. You know, when the Muslims learn about Christianity, they learn about how Christians came all the way from Europe just to, just to uh, kill them and take back Jerusalem. And what's also interesting is, uh, you know, on one of the failed crusades, I think it was the fourth, the crusaders returned through Constantinople, which is today Istanbul, and they decimated that city so badly that the Muslims were able to overrun it. And we lost a whole section of the Christian world in that moment, just because that's what they decided to do. The fight between uh, East and West was so big. You know, here's a great quote. Uh, it says, sadly, with the whole Constantinian shift, the church has become more like the world than the world becoming like the church. In many places, Christianity has solidified, even petrified, into a new type of social order that differs very little from the world around it. Every member of the church is called to ministry, and it is the mandate of all church leadership to train and equip the members of Christ's body. What's interesting, as we go through church history, a lot of reformation is actually connected to changes in society, points of view that changed, and, and so Christianity is exposed to the world. And, and if we think, you know, we, you know, we're free from that, that we are free agents with no one can affect us, we've just so misunderstood how we even think. You know, um, one of my favorite points to make with Christians about parenting and marriage is if you haven't been retrained, if your mind hasn't been renewed, don't be surprised when under pressure you just become whatever you saw growing up. You know, experts on conflict resolution say, without additional training, the average person solves conflicts the way that they learned to when they were nine years old. And that's why a lot of conflicts look like a bunch of nine-year-olds <laughs> talking to each other. Because they haven't learned anything about how to resolve these feelings, these issues, these relationships. We're going to move forward to the Reformation. Hopefully we can go through this fairly quickly. Um, you know, th there's a great book. I want to share this. Uh, if you want to read a great book about the roots of the Restoration Movement, uh, and this is more specifically even talking about the Churches of Christ, uh, this was written by Allen and Hughes. I can get it online. It's a great book. It really gives a great overview. And I, I took some of the, the, uh, the information in this section from this book. There's trends in society leading to the Reformation. For the first trend was called the Dark Ages. Though it's interesting, for the Muslims, the Dark Ages were the Golden Ages, yeah. the Golden Era. So it just depends how you look on it, right? Uh, in the Renaissance, people began to think for themselves. It started in about 1300, so the beginning of the 14th century. Humanism was there. Let's return to the ancient sources. So people started to pull out Socrates and Plato and all the, you know, the Greek writers and philosophers. They started to re-look re at that. And uh, this had its effect on Christianity as well. Um, sorry, I went the wrong way. One second. Uh, certain Catholic priests were the first to call for reform. Scripture alone which is an expression of Christian humanism, humanism back to the sources. Okay, so this actually, this was a societal swing, but it also affected the church in a big way. Um, and these are like famous people. You can, you can go through and read much more about this, but Martin Luther, one of the most well-known reformers, and uh, he just wanted to purify the historic institutional church but also wanted to preserve most of the tradition. He was really just trying to change some things. He had a problem with their Zwingli. He, he got more into the institutions of the church, and he saw the Bible as a normative pattern. Uh, Luther believed that Zing, Zing, Zwingli's insistence on making Scripture the exclusive norm for the entire life of the church 
including its forms of worship, turned the gospel into a new legalism. So, he, so Zwingli's talking freedom. Luther's looking at it saying, but that's legalism. Because he was holding on to traditions that Zwingli wanted to let go of. Uh, Conrad Grable, he uh, was a, uh, mentored by Zwingli. He took it even further, and he said, let's, let's get, you know, we need to get baptized as adults. So he was the beginning of the Anabaptist movement. You know, what's so interesting is uh, the Catholic Church began to protect, uh, kill the Protestants. The Protestants began to kill the Anabaptists. All in the name of Jesus and pure doctrine, okay? Uh, so Zwingli resisted these changes because he wanted the Constantinian-like relationship between the church and state. You know, why did the restoration begin and nobody get rid of infant baptism? Because they believed in a state-church relationship and they wanted you to be a German citizen and a Lutheran. Um, you know, we can you just go through all this uh, story. Uh, there's John Calvin. Uh, there's Bullinger, Bucer. I'm not going to read all this, but... But these guys affected then England. And why I mark England on this is because the Restoration Movement in its most influence came directly out of, uh, out of England and uh, the British Isles. So, you know, these things came over from the mainland, Christian humanism, covenant theology of William Tyndall. The, there's influence of the Swiss Reformed tradition and then temporary resurgence of Roman Catholicism. So they went Protestant, went back to Catholicism for a very short time and then went back again to uh, the Anglican uh, church. So, but you had the Anglican church. You know, we think the Anglican church. That, that, why did the Anglican church start? So Henry VIII could have a divorce. What a great spiritual reason to start a new church. But everyone knew it. And actually the Reformation that produced the Anglican church, the Anglicans would produce more denominations in the next hundred years than anybody else because they didn't have a theological grounding to their separation from the Catholic Church. And guess what? Everyone that had an opinion was sort of filling in the gaps, and that's where the Puritans came in, and uh, they wanted to purify the church, and uh, hence their name. And then they, they became, uh, a, a good part of them, Puritan separatists, and there were at the same time moderates. So the Puritans were a reaction. You know, people just keep reacting, right? Either they see something they want and they go after it, or they're reacting to somebody else. Uh, so then the Baptists were another spinoff that came from the Pur Puritans. And uh, by the early 1600, after decades of struggle, the Puritan efforts to restore the church seemed to have failed in England. And believing divine judgment imminent, many chose to flee England and find refuge in America. Now, this is a very interesting thing. A lot of these new Protestant religions had an idea that, that God was very intertwined with governmental work. And in fact, if the government didn't change, get out of the way because lightning is coming. So uh, that, that was part of what was going on. And they ended up fleeing then to uh, the United States. And there's a lot of things that happened in the Re Reformation movement that dates back to the Puritans. Um, and uh, the Swiss Reformed, I just want to read a point or two, the Swiss Reformed emphasis on restoring the form and structure of the primitive church re reached its greatest intensity here, so among the English Puritans. Most early members were British stock and Puritan lineage, now speaking about the Restoration Movement. Those individuals with early influence on Alexander Campbell, John Glass, Robert Sanderman, James Haldane, were not that unique, but in fact representative of 18th century Puritans. Believe it or not, we have some Puritan influence uh, somewhere deep down in our religious DNA. Uh, then the Puritans began to immigrate to America, and they then wanted to set up a Bible commonwealth. So they were, just, they were completely open about it. We, we are going to be basically God's people here on earth. Now, it's interesting, um, doing some research for another paper, I found out that by the time that America became a nation, by the time of the revolution, uh, 1776, the amount of church-going Puritans in New England was no different than churchgoers in any other part of the United States. You know, you, you read all these stories, uh, and the paper I had written that where I quoted this was called The Myth uh, of the Making of America. Uh, a nation, 
a, a free Christian nation or a nation free to be Christian? And the point was that America's constitution is not Christian. Jesus is not in the constitution. He's not in the de Declaration of Independence, but the first amendment is freedom of religion. And so, but if you look at the platform, it's a completely uh, just open to God. God is an unnamed creator in, in the constitution or in the declaration, I should say. So it's very interesting just to see this history. The Puritans migrated and they had this, they began what we call congregationalism. And uh, look at this influence. They had a leading pastor, teacher, uh, elders and deacons, membership through public church covenanting and examination by the elders. Boy, you think we had strict, you know, rules to get in? Okay. Uh, musical instruments, inappropriate because of the early church history. Interesting. Uh, this is something new coming up. Initially seeing restoration is ongoing, but within just a generation, the Puritans are already saying, we finished it. This is it. Um, Roger Williams broke away from them and he actually became, he had got a conviction about, in, about infant baptism that you shouldn't have infant baptism. He and his 10 friends baptized each other and started the first Baptist church in Rhode Island. Okay. Uh, and then they, then there were separate Baptists, uh, separated not just from the Puritans, but also from other Baptist groups. Uh, within 20 years, they'd moved down to the South and they started converting. And that actually became, uh, I think, the largest Protestant denomination in the world may be the Southern Baptist Convention. It's at least the largest in the United States. So, I mean, this is the history leading up into that. And uh, eventually, there'd be more separations. And um, this whole idea was we need to restore the primitive church. We didn't come up with that. People have been trying to restore the primitive church for centuries. And for some reason, we think we don't need to know anything about that and we can do it better. Uh, I don't know about you, but I think wisdom is learning from someone else's mistakes. When you got to learn from your own mistakes, that's just obvious. It's way better to learn from someone else. So if we don't know history, you know, we're bound to repeat it. This is a quote from... Uh, Allen and Hughes, we see here a very important contrast between reformation and restoration. One tended to stress that any interpretation of the Bible needs the very traditions it, helped, it has helped bring into being. The Bible mediates and conserves tradition. And the other sought a direct and unmediated understanding of scripture, rejecting almost completely the tradition shaped by church councils, theologians, and creeds. So basically there is one group trying to uh, reform, which is mean we're going we're gonna to be Christians, but we want to take all the history with us. And there's another group trying to restore saying, let's just jump over it. Uh, as with most things, well, usually when something boils down to two choices, the right choice is most often in the middle, somehow a combination of the two. So the, the restoration movement then came on the scene. Uh, what was its setting? You know, America, and this is such a terrible story, when you read about what happened to the First Nation peoples, uh, you know, talk about colonization, you know, just, just the tragedy of colonization, the disrespect of it. But from the European point of view, you know, people were fleeing the, the UK. I know that history better. That's, uh, you know, go, that's where my family came from. They came to uh, the, new, the New World because they could get land which they never could have bought if they'd stayed behind in the UK or British Isles at that point. So, you know, the identical quality of America, people heard about all this land. Oh yeah, there's a few natives there, but uh, you know, don't worry about them. Uh, there's all this land, you know, it's, it's a terrible story. Uh, American democracy was thought to be of God. Uh, Millennial expectation that the golden age was near. This, this discovery of a new Eden and the settling of this land, the ethos of it had people thinking, uh, Jesus is coming back soon. Actually, like all of the founders of the uh, restoration movement thought this. They anticipated that Jesus is coming soon. Now, they, most of them weren't millennialists, so they weren't trying to, they weren't labeling it a thousand years. They weren't, they weren't trying to get that specific. Uh, other American groups would do that. But they had this conviction, Jesus is coming. 
The new, this new world is just the beginning. So they went there for freedom of old, not word, but world traditions and state-run churches and the assurance associated with returning to a primitive faith. Now, it's interesting. The churches of Christ basically came out of nowhere. Uh, they came, the, the original ministers, we'll talk a little bit about them, but they were Presbyterian ministers. Uh, they, were, they, they were the launching pad that started uh, the restoration movement. But, but I just want to show you something most people don't realize about the United States. This is putting, this is the percentage of religious adherence in the United States and uh, how it's going up over the decades. And so it, it peaked basically, I mean, it kept moving forward, even till now it's 62%. But, I mean, this is now 2000, but you have to understand something. Most immigrants coming to the United States are religious. They bring their religion with them. So the United States has a lot of, you know, the fastest growing churches in the UK are black African churches. Those are the fastest growing churches in the UK. I've heard some statistics, they may be the only actual growing churches in the UK. Uh, they are mostly growing by uh, immigration, but they're still growing. And uh, it's interesting just to see this because it's almost like my father did this in the chicken industry. He made a stake to claim of a portion of the industry and then rode the growth of the industry for 30 years and started, you know, with a few. Uh, 100,000 chickens a year, and in the end was producing 34 million a year. But if you look, he, he captured about 6% of Canadian market share and held on to it for 30 years. Wow. Well, I, I think the same thing was happening in America. America was finding religion. I mean, think about it. If America was so religious, and that, that's a whole other conversation, but there's a myth of the religious founding of America. If America was so religious, why all the revival meetings? They don't go together. If everyone's already believers, you don't have big tent revivals and people, you know, like people are being converted by the thousands. And uh, the restoration movement got in on the action. You know, you can look at it historically. I think we've ridden a few waves even in our movement. I'll tell you what, we rode the wave of freedom coming to the Soviet Union in, in our early years in the 90s. Everything was just popped right open. I like to say communism, Soviet communism, was the best manure ever poured on a human soul. <laughs> okay, you guys understand the word manure? Yeah. It's the doo-doo from cows and chickens that you throw on the ground. Okay, but anyway, uh, it helps the things to grow when you put it on, okay? Um, you know, the restoration movement, um, there's a lot of things that were going on. I'm not going to get into these de details too much because I want to get on to just us. But... Basically speaking, there was a number of figures basically going against their denominations. First, in that slide, I just zipped through, and I'll send anyone who wants the slides, get the slides. Um, in, the, in that slide, it had a, a, a Methodist and a Pres... Uh, sorry, a Methodist and a... I want to get that right. A Methodist and a Baptist that were pretty significant in some of the restoration thought. But it would be actually some Presbyterian ministers who become the key figures. And Barton Stone would be the one who began first. And uh, he wanted to break down denominal, denominational division. And he just wanted everyone to call themselves Christians and stop belonging to the sex. So that was, that was his message. Uh, he was committed to liberty and freedom, viewed denominational structures as a Babylon wilderness of confusion and strife. So he had a view that there were real Christians out there. We just need to come out. We need to be together. That was his, his idea. Stone made converts, especially among the Baptists, and by 1811 had 13,000 uh, members. He, he actually did better than the Campbells did. Uh, in fact, the Campbells started to steal some of his flock, and then eventually he, uh, you know, they joined forces. So the Stone movement was restorationist. It was actually not focused so much on the primitive forms and doctrines as it was on just being Christian, the experience of God. The, it, was, it was a more spiritual angle, uh, quite different from the Campbells, especially Alexander. So Thomas Campbell, he arrived in America. Uh, he got dismissed quite quickly from the Presbyterian church because he was associating with liberals. 
there's a story about him uh, starting an organization and then closing it because he realized the moment that he wrote the, dec- wrote the charter, he'd just become a denomination again. And so it was the last, it became the last will and testament of that uh, church. Alexander Campbell, his son, arrived a little bit later, took up the leadership of the, what his father had begun. And he was greatly influenced by some of the philosophical thinking uh, in the UK, in the British Isles at the time. And uh, he thought about the Bible as a book of facts. And if people would just follow the facts and limit themselves to that, then the divisions would just not be possible. Uh, so he rejected certain practices uh, as being um, non-essential. The holy kiss, deaconesses, communal living, foot washing, charismatic exercises. And he, arg- he argued for autonomy, plurality of elders in every congregation, weekly communion, and eventually immersion for the remission of sins. And there was one point where he and his group were called Reform Baptists. Uh, that, that was their title for a while. They kind of hid within the Baptist group and then eventually broke away from that. So, uh, you know, it was interesting. Um, they were very different. Stone and Campbell were very different. Uh, Campbell's movement, though, uh, had this clarity of biblical understanding that Stones didn't. And to be honest, uh, Stones, Stones people, they, they were impressed by that. You know, it's pretty good to be excited and just kind of moving by the, you know, how it feels, if, you know, reading the Bible, being biblical, but, but not really structurally looking for those kind of answers. Uh, I think uh, Campbell attracted enough of Stone's believer that, that that's what brought Stone into conversation with Campbell and willing to go basically under Campbell. It's called the Stone-Campbell movement, but it was really, that was just, that's a nice way of putting it. Uh, Stone was first, but it's kind of like Paul and Barnabas. It soon became Campbell movement more than anything. So I, in discussions I had in the South growing up, uh, somebody came up to me one side, I told him I was with the Church of Christ. He goes, you Campbellite. Campbellite, okay. But you know, they still remember that. Can you imagine this? Like a hundred and something years later, I'm a Campbellite, okay. Um, anyways, uh, Campbell had just taught very clearly about baptism for the immersion, for the remission of sins. And uh, this really helped people be attracted to it. The, the, the certainty of it, okay? And uh, some of the Stonite preachers, they were encouraged to join. And uh, you know, as it says here, Campbell quickly overshadowed Stone. And then, uh, but, but they both shared the conviction that through the recovery of primitive Christianity, the millennium would dawn, freedom needed to be won from clergy and called a unity of all believers based on an apostolic model was the answer to the religious pluralism. Uh, but Campbell was frightened uh, by the then common supposition that the Holy Spirit might work on the hearts and men and women separate and apart from the Bible. Now, he was a, a great Bible student, but he was afraid of this element. And Stone, that was part of Stone's ethos, listen to the Spirit, that kind of thing. It got suppressed, sadly. Um, so he didn't, Campbell didn't say the Spirit can't work outside the Bible, but disciples of Campbell definitely would go there. And uh, that is the church that I grew up in and that Steve grew up in. Um, You know, soon it became orthodoxy that the Holy Spirit exerts no influence except through the Bible. Man, that's a very sad thing. That that was something as a teenager, I began to doubt, you know, severely, uh, just in my experience of church. So um, eventually the movement faltered and it divided. Um... As the years passed, Campbell and his followers in the upper Midwest increasingly accepted unity in plural, pluralistic diversity. In other words, they were more open to keep looking for faithful brothers and sisters among the other churches. Um, what's interesting about that is uh, I got to study a church history class with the other side, with one of the other divisions of the Campbell movement, the Stone Campbell movement. And they don't talk about Campbell's early life. They like his later life. But I grew up learning about his early life because that's kind of the division. Campbell almost in a way had sort of two movements. And the one he grew into isn't the one that, you know, caught on fire in the south, uh, in the the southern area of the United States. Um, So 
You know, the Civil War was a big issue. Uh, the Restoration Movement ended up splitting in 1906. And uh, the Church of Christ emerged with extraordinary strength in the region once dominated by the Freedom Movement of Stone. I mean, it's kind of a sad fact to look back on. There were some people that looked back on what Stone was doing and had been saying and, and treasured it, but they were not the majority and they didn't affect the general direction uh, of the Churches of Christ. And so uh, this idea, uh, what ended up happening in the Restoration Movement is we don't have any traditions. And what the authors, uh, Allen and Hughes, want to point out is the tradition that we have no traditions became our central tradition. Uh, that, that is our tradition. You know, the funniest thing is, once you believe you don't have any traditions, you don't even look for them. Uh, if you believe you've arrived in restoring the church, you're not going to ask critical questions. In fact, it would be considered blasphemy to do so. So... Um, since those early days, the members of the Church of Christ have assumed they are people with no history, no tradition, a people whose roots only lie in the Bible. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just a little review of the things we've talked about. I just wanted to say that most of the religious groups in the United States, this is a tragic story, before the Civil War, the Baptists, Methodists, and Presbyterians already divided north and south. So what should have kept the United States together was actually the Christianity, it had already divided. And so the Civil War was easy because the church is already divided. Now, the Churches of Christ, the Restoration Movement, didn't divide, but we were still too, too young. But it actually, when you look at how it would divide later, it has a lot to do with the north-south boundary. Um, what happened was they had their a mission society in the north, and the government required that they make a political statement against the South, which they did. And that's what made the South react so much to the mission societies. There'd been a few, people are willing to go with it, but when a mission society took the side of the North, the South reacted. The other thing was instrumental music, which the people in the South couldn't, couldn't uh, afford. So it was more of an economic question and it became a doctrinal question. Uh, it didn't help. Alexander Campbell made a comment that, you know, do I want instrumental music in the church? No, that's like ringing a cowbell. And that quote was quoted many, many times. Uh, and who knows what he was really thinking. Uh, maybe they just had really bad musicians where he was. I don't know. But uh, uh, anyways, that quote became like gospel. One guy that stood out in all of this, uh, at the t at, after the split even, this man continued to preach on both sides of the split. And I, I just mention him here because he brings up a phrase. Uh, you know, you've heard this, we speak where the Bible speaks and are silent where the Bible is silent. See, he understood that silence to be a matter of not, not determining dogma or doctrine, it's about accepting each other. So if the scripture doesn't say anything, we need to be united and, let, and give people freedom, which was the platform that Alexander Campbell really was pushing for but didn't successfully make. Now, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna skip over this just a time. Uh, what's very interesting, there's a, a very well-known scholar in the mainline churches, and in 1973, he talked about the restoration principle. The biblical ideal to be the New Testament church today, number two, to practice undenominational unity of the church, and then finally, restoring man to the image of God. These are actually wonderful, it's a wonderful article. Uh, I was 15, year old, 15 years old when he wrote this. The first one, I believed I was part of a fully restored New Testament church. That's what I'd been told. I didn't know any better. Uh, I thought uniformity was to be expected more than diversity. I thought all the churches were supposed to be really the same. And then finally, my mission and my purpose were the same thing. I had confused what I could do for God and who I was becoming by God's grace. So I was going to be a missionary. I had made God put that on my heart when I was six years old, and I never veered from that. You know, it's interesting. Um, that, that to me was, I'd, I was already good. I'm good with God. I've decided to be a missionary. That was my identity. So you can understand why when I met the Boston Movement in 1982, that was all gung-ho for missions. Man, I was like, where do I sign up? 
You know, it, 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 it had me at the word missions. Anyway, um, come now to the International Churches of Christ. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to roughly go through this. Uh, there was a crossroads movement that was begun basically in reflection of Campus Crusade, the Navigators. The Churches of Christ wanted in on the action on these uh, secular campuses, and so they started these, uh, these movements. Uh, Kip was baptized in one of these. Kip then began to work in this movement. Uh, Kip uh, worked at various Churches of Christ, and finally in 1979, he met with the Lexington Church. Um, you know, this what was new, this was radical. Kip said to the whole church, not just the campus group, we all need to be disciples. We all need to count the cost. We all need to be 100% for God. And that had not happened in any singular church. There, what happened was that the, the crossroads ministries were like little, little parts of a church. Um, Kip wrote uh, a first principle series. And uh, from his own words, the most significant uh, formula there was saved equals Christian equals disciple. Uh, it actually, I, I changed this in our Russian studies and afterwards equals baptized disciple because you have to become a disciple before you get baptized. So uh, how can you be just be a, saved by being a disciple? You have to be a baptized. Anyway, sorry, being technical. But you go back in time. So how new was First Principles? Here's a First Principles series from 1911. Here's the lessons. The Bible, God's book, sin and its cure, Jesus Christ as person in office, Holy Spirit one, Holy Spirit two, faith, repentance, and confession, baptism, the church, its establishment and membership, the church, its worship and ministry. It's all good till that last lesson on non-instrumental music. Anyway, okay. <laughs> you know, the history of our movement, we began planting churches. Uh, um, Kip had an amazing vision. Uh, Kip is a very charismatic and strategic leader. Uh, church plantings in Chicago and London, uh, first world mission seminar. That's actually my introduction. I went down to visit. Uh, church was renamed the Boston Church because the churches in the New Testament were simply called by the name of their city, which is a somewhat of an interesting point uh, since the church in Rome was never called that because there were churches in Rome. Uh, not a single church, but that's a whole other conversation. Uh, <laughs> prayer partners, often self-initiated, evolved into discipleship partners which are more directive with leadership assigning an older and stronger Christian to give, uh, Christ, uh, to give direction to younger, weaker disciples. Okay. Um, to be honest, many of us have gone back more to prayer partners, uh, if we're going to use that kind of vernacular. Uh, church planting in New York. Uh, yeah. And uh, Steve was there. And then uh, Boston attendance reaches 1,000. These are just some highlights. Church planting to Providence, Rhode Island, Toronto, Canada, more. Uh, former, former recognition of the women's ministry role. Now we have five churches in three nations. Church plantings, Johannesburg, South Africa, Paris, France, and Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, I got to be on that one. Uh, first reconstruction and uh, former crossroads ministries reconstructed and, and people then came into the Boston movement. Uh, Sam Lang, Tom Brown, and Sydney was reconstructed. That brought the Fontenot's in. And... Um, but we're getting a reaction from people because of these reconstructions and uh, the tech and how it was done. Another long conversation. Um, you know, we just go through all of this. We, we have a history. And basically, we began as a church planting movement. Uh, we are a discipleship movement. That's what we are called. We are church planting movement. Um, and those are exciting things to be part of. Um, we then began to structure ourselves in just the late, nine, uh, it was September 1988, world sector leaders were appointed. And I wasn't one and I never thought I would ever be one, uh, but, but they were appointed and we began a new structure, okay? Uh, Moscow was planted in 91, 100th planting. Uh, Kip McKean wrote Restoration Through Revolution One. John Vaughn, Vaughn calls us International Churches of Christ. And then, uh, Listed some restorations. We'll talk about those in a second. Discipleship Magazine discontinued. KNN started. Evangelism Proclamation Six-Year Plan announced. Uh, in a, we're going to go to 100. And, sorry, a plan to plant a church of disciples in all 170 nations with a city over 100. Geographic sector leaders appointed. Church Growth Today names LA fastest growing church in North America. Kip McKean wrote Restoration Through Revolution Two. Sunday attendance exceeded 100,000 for the first time. Discipling churches now in all 50 U.S. states. 
Church Growth Today names LA Church fastest growing church in North America for second time. LA breaks 10,000. I mean, there's a lot of action happening here. Uh, in 1996, Nationals lead most churches. First native, third world of elders appointed, New Delhi. Syria planted 100th nation. Armenia planted 300th church. LA breaks 20,000 on Sunday. Evangel evangelization proclamation fulfilled. Kip asked to step down by majority of world sector leaders, start sabbatical, unity meeting in Long Beach. Kip officially resigns, et cetera. Uh, world sector leaders disband. That was voluntary. Proposed a conference in May that never happened because the Henry Creek got, letter got written and it left our hands. We lost all control of what was going on in our movement worldwide. Um, May 2003 meeting never took place. Kip McKean moves to Portland. First International Leadership Conference. Second IOC Chicago. Third IOC, these are the International Leadership Conferences. Kip was removed from the program because of divisive talk. And then, uh, you know, we go on. Unity, unity proposal was suggested uh, to, to, because we'd lost our centralized organization. Um, Brothers Warren Kip, and at that time about 7.5 million are being given for missions. The unity proposal renamed a plan for united cooperation and 80% within three months signed up for it. And that's the sort of the rebirthing of the ICOC. So there's just a lot of things that, that were going on. Um, this is what the church looked like after the cooperation proposal. We had all these service teams. Uh, these were global. Uh, though most of them were based in the U.S., but they were trying to reach out and be a blessing to those outside. So uh, World Discipleship Jubilee held in San Antonio, more than 17,000 in attendance, and 10th ILC in San Antonio. Okay, so you can go to my site, and if you want to read more about how, what happened with ICOC uh, back about five years ago when we uh, this plan came for a uh, ICOC 3.0, in the end, what was decided was something that was called ICC uh, 2.1. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to run through this. There's, there's videos you can find that will go through this. Uh, I just want to end with this. Um, Kip wrote in 1992 about all the restorations that, that had been done. And uh, so, you know, I, I've taken the things that he said, they're in brown, and I'm, I'm agreeing with a number of them. Jesus baptizing only people who made the decision to be a disciple. I grew up in the, in the mainline churches of Christ. And if someone wanted to get baptized, they got baptized that night. There was no counting the cost. There was no, this is going to sound funny. First time I sat in on a counting of the cost, uh, which might have been my own. Um, I just thought, this is genius. Actually, I'd read the study. I read the study. I thought, this is genius. Someone did do it with me, but I had read it before I even did it. But I thought, wow, where's this study been? Because it was so clear what someone was getting into. So I have to say, that's a great, that's a great restoration. Um, though it wasn't that there wasn't happening in some places, but it definitely wasn't happening as a standard in the churches where I was. Every Christian's purpose to seek and save the laws, I think we'd agree with that, but weren't being trained to do it. Daily accountability and openness with one another, these are good things. Discipleship groups, planting churches, New Testament lifestyle of giving and sacrifice for missions, the leadership role, and discipling of women. Okay? But there's some things that basically Kip was saying these are restored, but they weren't restored. Ongoing discipling for every Christian in a local church. <laughs> Quoting Matthew 28 20, this was our failing, in fact. Our greatest problem was we didn't keep training people. So we say there's ongoing training, but we're just training them to go get another person. You know, like it's so funny how the second part teach them to obey everything. Oh, and that brings me to the first part. You need to go make disciples. You know, like it just circled back on itself. Uh, we need to dwell there for a little bit, right? So, uh, you know, this is just an, a point. This is all on, on my site. But this is, is pre-2003. Uh, the, the tipping point of our movement was in 1999, the, and the crisis of negative growth was predictable completely by 2003. In other words, Crete letter or not, this was going to happen as a matter of fact. Uh, Henry just happened to pen something at a time when people were looking for an answer. Uh, sadly, I think even people used it as a scapegoat 
Oh, how, what a convenient thing. The letter did this. I can tell you that that isn't what happened. We did that. Uh, if you want to talk about the glory days, you've got to ad- admit the glory days brought the next days that followed. Uh, the role and power of the Holy Spirit. I, I will say this. Our studies, first principles, only basically told us what the Holy Spirit didn't do, but promised in the baptism study that you will get it. What you're supposed to do with it, your guess is as good as anybody else's. Okay, it's like that unopened Christmas present still sitting on the shelf. And, uh, you know, what's happened, I mean, in 19, by 1988, I'd written an extra study to put into first principles uh, about the Holy Spirit, about the indwelling Holy Spirit, about what it means. To me, it's one of the most encouraging studies to do. To me, the indwelling Holy Spirit is the most powerful way to deal with sin and temptation in my life is the sanctification and presence of God in me. That's what helped me as a young Christian. And uh, I knew the Bible, so I knew what I was getting. But a lot of people get baptized, they don't know what they're getting. We also added one in Sweden, which stayed with us, and that was about faith. Because we talk a lot about faith, but don't really explain how it, uh, you know, how it works. How f- faith is a response to God. House churches. This is great, but it was officially abandoned by Boston in 1990. And you can read this in this article you find on the site. This is just a quote from there. But basically what it's saying is, look at point three. The zone will function as the house church of the Bible. Now you think about all the great things about a house church. This is 1990. This is significant. This is when the gear shifted and suddenly being a mega church was more important than house churches. And this thing changed and, and I, I, do, I go through a little analysis, but when, there, when Boston had house churches, half of the leaders, because the house church was the significant you know, thing of how the church worked, uh, half of the leaders didn't work for the church. When the church sectorized, everybody worked for the church. So we went from clergy laity mix to just clergy in one foul swoop, okay? Um, revival of prayer and fasting? I just want to say we needed more of this, okay? It it was talked about, but not with enough, you know, emphasis. World vision. Um, I will say that uh, I I met nobody like Kip and still never have who had such a world vision. Um, But in 1994, the goalposts moved. We've all done the discipleship study. And we know that if we can do this for 33 years, we'll have evangelized the world. But uh, I have to go to the graph right there. Okay, so here is the blue line. That is the discipleship study. That's one disciple making one more disciple every year. And I got to tell you something. If you actually think about that model, what percentage of growth is doubling? It's 100% growth. Wow. That, I mean, we used to talk about 100% growth like it was nothing. You know why? Because we started on the shoulders of another movement, had a lot of people move in, both former this mainline church and then Crossroads Ministries. And so if you follow that blue line, we were way ahead. See, the green line, light green, that is... The, the membership of the Boston movement. But look at that. It was only in 1994 that we showed that we were not going to evangelize the world in a generation by this model. In fact, by 1994, we are already growing linearly. And we basically continued on that same linear, literal line for the next 10 years. What I'm saying is this. By 1994... Whatever we were doing, it was not going to win the world for Christ in one generation. It was not going to happen. But we didn't change that. Instead, we changed the goal. Let's do the six-year plan, okay? Uh, And there we have this, the evangelization proclamation. You know, Kip writes in in, um, his first revolution through restoration or restoration through revolution, he writes, you know, he had a relative that was was, uh, something to do with the Declaration of Independence, or the Constitution, some, somebody back in that day. 
gee, we're right here, right again. We're, we're back, right at the historic beginning point, okay? Uh, you know what's odd about this proclamation? Only two of those signatures are people living outside the United States when this was penned. So we're going to evangelize the world, and guess what? We're going to do it from the United States. Okay, uh, that's this whole other thing. Yes, that's busy, that's com complicated, but let me just tell you, this is how much churches were growing on the average. Look what was happening in the 80s. We'd plant a church, and in five years, the average church between 87 and 89 was 446 members after five years. See that black line? That's the, the growth of those plantings five years in. By 1996, 98, we, were, we are churches after five years, 54 members. We can't even be self-supporting. The average church couldn't be self-supporting. But the six-year plan pulled back support after three years. So we were left in most of Europe with churches that reached a certain size. And if they didn't get the critical mass, many of them went without staff for a decade till the mission societies got back engaged. You know, here's another way of looking at this. Um, this is what the plantings added to the membership of the existing ICOC. So over three years, what they added over five years. See, what, what happened is, though we're planting more and more churches, 33, 50, 58, 117, we're actually adding less members. We're planting more, adding less. And here's why. The average team size before the, the proclamation was 16 people per team. The average team size after was seven. That's the average team size for hundreds of churches. No wonder we couldn't get anywhere. We, we just started with a Bible talk. And often it was just a Bible talk leader. What impressed me about Boston when I moved there in 1983 was that if a team wasn't ready to go out, they didn't go out. They were delayed, they were held back. After the proclamation, if you had a grandmother, this is someone else's joke, but uh, <laughs> if you had a grandmother, an unbaptized teen, and a Bible talk leader, you had a mission team, as long as they could get visas. <laughs> and honestly, we sent them there. You know what you can see here? By the end of 2002, 13 of the new plantings had already ceased to exist. That's got nothing to do with 2003. You know, those are real people. Those mission teams... I met these two guys that went to Tunisia. I call it Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. <laughs> these sweet young men went from the parish church to this Middle Eastern country, which is known for persecuting Christians, and they're supposed to plant the church? And they were just trying to stay alive for six months, <laughs> going from spot to spot. They had occasional Bible study, and uh, Tammy and I got to get involved in the Middle East. My first message to them, Brothers, go home, find good wives. Thank you very much. Uh, get married, enjoy your life. Sorry you even got put out here. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's irresponsible to have done this. And there were people squawking already in 97 out there in the mission field saying, we can't do this. This is killing us. And we know the answer was because I was one of the ones squawking, even though actually we, we didn't have a problem with that goal. It was the... Uh, uh, the answer was, we've, we've written it, we've signed it, we got to do it. Whoa. And you're just like, really? So, uh, you know, whatever. I mean, uh, there's so much I could say. Okay, so, the training of evangelists, I will also say, we have to define what an evangelist is. Biblically speaking, an evangelist was a missionary. We basically were training pastors, in most cases, to become the lead figure of a local church. Uh, but we called an evangelist. We would have think about if we called the lead role a shepherd, not an evangelist. Hmm. Just changing that name has some implications to uh, what we had done. So uh, some restorations occurred in the first century. Uh, sorry, I, I read that. Agree, but incomplete. Church building's not essential. That's a that's a great theory. They're not essential. Though when I moved to LA in 1999, we owned three properties. Uh, actually, one got bought right after I got there, and we, we were into properties well over $25 million as an L.A. church. Okay, so that didn't stay as a, as a rule, a practice. I mean, aware of angels, demons, and spiritual battle in the universe, 
Uh, honestly, sometimes I think we're fighting so much with each other, I don't know that we were worried about angels or demons or anybody else. Um, church government, especially role of evangelists and elders. Uh, you know, I, I will say this, our movement still struggles to appoint people as elders. And I, my theory, it's hard to appoint elders into a hierarchical authority system. They did because they're not part of that. And so you have to really come up with a theology of how to make that work. Um, in one of my articles, my rebuttal of Flavel Yakely's book, I talk about the conflict that was already existing in the Church of Christ, are elders over uh, evangelists or evangelists over elders? That was a conversation in the mainline churches at the time of our movement. Now, not true restorations. One church, one city. Man, this, it, this is an amazing thought uh, because what it really means is one church, one city, one leader. That is the ICC model. Uh, you know, I'm not here to divide all our churches, but there comes a point where it's not practical anymore. And uh, if you build something so big, leaders can't help but take care of other leaders as a full-time job. That's what happens in a hierarchical structure. It's not healthy. It's not good. Uh, I just, uh, yeah, this is, the, this, this is my rebuttal to the dilemma, uh, Discipling Dilemma book. But it was just interesting here because here I made an argument about autonomy. And, you know, Kip talks about autonomy all the time like it's like the Satan's tool. Um, the funniest thing is uh, the churches of Christ grew better in their first 40, 40 years than we have. And continued to grow. The, the restoration movement far exceeded anything we're on trajectory to do. Yet we have, have somehow found the better model. And uh, I made this argument. See, autonomy. Kip made everyone think that autonomy was they're completely isolated. But there was preacher training schools. There was magazines. There was all sorts of interaction. Uh, there, was, there was a lot of things holding the churches of Christ together. So yes, the local congregation was autonomy, but there was actually overarching organizations. They just didn't like to see it that way. So if you look, this is from uh, one of the studies. That orange line is the trajectory of our movement from uh, basically 89 to 2001. Now, what's interesting, when the Stone Campbell movement united... Uh, this, this, the recorded stats we have say there was 22,000. When the Boston movement gathered in the, the other people that would join them, we were 21,213, almost the same number. So it's almost a legitimate, identical starting point. But see how slowly the restoration movement went? But they kept going. That's their real stat. And they went on well over to 2 million. Okay, so... We, we have people telling us autonomy can't work. Well, that's autonomy, at least uh, restoration movement style autonomy. Now, I'm not, I'm not preferring that model. I'm just saying you make, we're making a false argument. So there's what we did. There's the resultant crash. We started growing again, and look where we're headed right now. And to be honest, post-COVID, we've, jumped, we've dropped our trajectory even a little bit. So what am I saying? I'm saying this whole thing about models and, you know, the, the traditional church, we should have been asking questions to learn from the uh, mainline church. You know, Kip calls it the traditional church because you can't upset a bunch of mainline people more than calling them traditional. Of course, that, you know, it's just whack. Uh, they, they don't see themselves that way. But anyway, you know, here's the Catholic church. Um, gee, look at that. Pope, cardinals, archbishop, bishop, priests, deacons, lay, that, that's the world right there. Hmm, let's just overlay that. Okay. Oh, there's the Pope. Pope Admiral One. Okay. Okay, I got to say something here. How ironic. The restoration movement was running from the Catholic Church. That's what we were running from. And in, in rejecting that, look where we went. And uh, this is still alive, this group. It's just not ICOC anymore, okay? But what's happened? It's because we need to, being a Bible church, I like to think of us, we are our second generation church. You know, I just want to say, we need the charisma that we saw in the beginning. 
We can't set up a world where nobody can have like the gift of inspiration. Don't you want to be inspired? I mean, there, there's, we've had, we had some amazing speakers in our day. I don't count myself as one of them, but we have some amazing speakers who could just memorize, mesmerize a crowd and get everyone really excited. That's a gift. Um, but you know, if you just use only the gift you have, it can become dangerous. There's two other articles I just wanted to bring your attention to. Uh, this first one was written in 1994, and it's called To the Jews First and to the Gentiles. I gave every new geographic sector leader one of these. It's the tale of two movements. You know why I wrote this? Because I was tired of this rhetoric of God's only movement. I mean, if God wants to pronounce that in sky rating, I'll take it. But for us to pronounce that... Who are we? The world is gigantic, and we've just barely scratched the surface of it. Uh, what a statement. And I subtitled this in, this in this internet print, The Tale of Two Movements, okay? It was originally two stages of world evangelism. Same point. Um, that wasn't... That, you, you didn't read my papers. They didn't get very far. Uh, they went to the circular file, you know, the trash bin. But anyway, uh, the other one, with great charisma comes great responsibility. This is a study about charisma in church leadership. And I just want to tell you, Kip ticks every box. And uh, I've tried to be more like that. A charismatic leader has a sense of, the, of history. A charismatic leader has a vision for the future. A charismatic leader understands a problem and offers a solution. That's three of the six characteristics and you know what? Kip got full marks in every one of those. And sadly, if we don't get a little more charismatic ourselves, we're just going to stagnate. But we've got to find that vision again. I think a lot of our young people would be inspired to see that. You know, I'm, I'm at the end. This is the Boston church, the flagship of our movement. Most people don't know it hit its tipping point in 1989 and then crashed. And then it got sort of firmed up and grew sort of like we're growing now as a movement. Just grew steady, solid, but it wasn't inspiring. Let's put it that way. It was work. You know, there's a way to build the church where we're inspired. We're inspired not by the result. It's by being used by God. It's by building his church. And I put that out there because this is one of the best kept secrets of our movement. We never had a conversation, what happened to Boston? It was not a public conversation. And Kip left at the end of 1989. Uh, and then he went to LA. And within three years, LA was called now the flagship of the movement. And LA's graph looks just the same. It's just three times higher in every dimension because of all the resources that they were able to get. But it's the exact same pattern. And then that's what the pattern, the movement took itself. We have a lot of good things in our past. I just want to close out with this verse. This was from last year. Christ gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, shepherds, teachers, ministers, to prepare God's people for works of service, the ministry, to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and unity in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. No longer infants, sorry, tossed by waves, blown by the wind of teaching, by the cunning and craftiness and deceitful scheming of men, instead speaking the truth in love, in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. I hope I answered your questions because I don't think we've got much time left. 